have you ever thought to yourself, I would like to be triggered right now. And then you're like, I know what I can do. I can put on some Kennedy Hall and the Quan. And what better topic is there to be triggered about than music? Everyone has an opinion on it. Everyone disagrees. This sounds like a fantastic time. So, let the triggering begin. What is music? Got about that. So, what is good music versus not good music? Right. So, I define good music as um, so. M music is an art that uses ordered sounds ordered pitches and rhythms and harmonies to move us. Uh, it moves us emotionally. Um, this is what music essentially does. Uh, and so the question, the... Okay, first problem. We already have a problem here. Oh, is there anything better than getting all hyped up on hot black tea at 7.30 at night when you're recording this? Oh, man, I'm be up all night long. <laughs> Emotions and passions are two different things. And sometimes in philosophers talk, they actually just mix them up. Quan actually corrects us later when he says that uh, it moves the passions, even though he's, I think he's still wrong on the, the ones he talks about. Anyway, don't take music moves the emotions. Take music moves the passions, the pathos, if you will. And it's a, it's, it's a very complex topic, and that's one of the reasons why music is always impossible to nail down. And I actually wrote my master's thesis on the nature of music and the uh, passions, the Apollonian, Dionysian, two axes, axes, you know. But jazz affects the passions differently than Baroque does. But to my mind, Baroque music is dancing music. Jazz is dancing music. You can't listen to jazz, the beep bop, beep bop, ba doo, without like, you feel it. Oh, yeah. Oh, by the way, that's not even an original thought by me. There's, there's actual um, composers in the world, musicians who play jazz versions of Baroque music, most specifically Bach. It, it's actually a thing. The, the proper question is, how is music moving you? Uh, is it moving you towards virtue or away from virtue, towards vice, right? Well, how does that happen? The moral virtues, actually all of them concern our emotions or passions or feelings. That's what moral virtues are about. So for example, the virtue of temperance concerns pleasures of touch and our desire for those things. You know, um, how much we, how, 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 how moved we are by those goods um, to the extent that we'd even, let's say, put aside the goods of reason or other goods of society for the sake of pursuing these things. So is music moving you towards virtue or away from virtue towards vice? Listening to this podcast is moving me away from virtue. That much is for certain. But there's a, a problem here, right? Because what I what I laid out in my um my master's thesis, which I never finished, so I can't say I have a master's. I wrote it, I didn't complete the paper. Is all music resonates or dissonates with you, or it appears as a simple like sounds that you don't really interact with. But really what music is, is those sounds which either resonate, they hit you and you're like, oh, I like this, oh, I'm so happy. Let me entertain the passion that it's um, giving me, or it dissonates with you, it oppresses you and you fight against it. It's a bit of a habit in the uh, Greek and Thomistic tradition sense, and it's a bit of a culture within you. And it's largely passive. It largely passively resonates with you, usually. And it's it's a huge problem when we have these discussions that, like, the vice of music, is music evil? Um, In the uh, Catholic Family podcast episode on music, which was actually uh, surprisingly good, it was so very vague because they're like, oh, jazz. Jazz makes you feel really, huh, huh, hello, ladies. I've listened to jazz my whole life. That's not why I'm that way. But like, I mean, if it was, I, I, I should be married and some other people I know who hate jazz shouldn't be married. I mean, it's, 
it's a lot less specific than you really think it is. So after saying some things I entirely disagree with, the Quan continues on. I mean, it's it needs to be said, in a topic such as music, there's literally no humanly possible way we're going to agree on everything. It just, it just doesn't work that way. And, and so the different types of music actually inspire different kinds of feelings in us. And so really the question comes down to what sort of feelings and what mm-hmm. amount of those feelings mm-hmm. and what object for those feelings is appropriate for a man and for a Christian, for a good man and for, for a practicing Christian. So because music gives me feelings and like what's appropriate for a man and for a Christian. Well, I think that um, having lots of kids is a good thing. Uh, jazz helps with that, apparently. I think everyone who's married should be listening to jazz. Okay. Um, monks, uh, no monk should ever listen to jazz. Okay, we, we, we've got this down. Um, Baroque music makes you dance. Priests aren't supposed to dance. No priests can listen to Baroque music. Uh, young people, you know, courting people, they should all be listening to Baroque music. Yeah, like, you can see what I'm getting at. This is, this is kind of silly. And so from that point of view, I so, sort of from that starting point in the first part of this book, I, I give a, a critique of, I give it an, an evaluation, let me put it that way, of different kinds of music in which I say, look, if the music is stirring up your irascible or your concupiscible appetites in a disordered way, in a way that's making it harder for you to be chaste or harder for you to be meek, then you need to get rid of that music from your life because it's not helping you to be a good man or a good Christian. What about your concupiscible passions and you're like, you need to go do something. And so it's like, you're like, hey, put some jazz on. Do you see the lady say they're picante? Oh, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Let's go get married. Let's go get a girlfriend. It's like, no, I, I think in that case, it's not. The, he's using the passions in the Thomistic sense and the irascible passion is actually about overcoming an obstacle and your relationship to it that's actually the wrong passion to use that's why i use the apollonian or dionysian binary which is what i discovered was the um more commonly used binary when i was uh, researching for my master's thesis and the apollonian means the abstract the form of the music the idea of the music and the dionysian is the emotive power or the colors of the music so it's a little bit harder to understand what he's trying to say if you're like you listen to jazz though, and you like see a hot chick, and then you're like, "What?" Like it's not like, "Oh, I listen to jazz." Oh no, if I see a woman, oh no, ah, my eyes, my eyes. Like, do these people have any tolerance for anything at all? Like, are are they so innocent that like they listen to um, ACDC for the first time? I'm back. I'm just acting it like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm literally wearing black. Wow, what is this? Like, what's what, what guys? Right. Um, but if the music that you're listening to elevates your mind, if it elevates your mind to God, that's sacred music. That's that's going to be wonderful. That's going to do wonders for you. But also, if it's like good folk music, there is really good authentic folk music. Or if it's classical, what we call classical music, which I don't really like as a term because it's it's too big of a of a category. It covers everything, you know, from from a thousand years. But good folk music is what? What is he drinking? Folk music is trash. Well, I used to live at Franciscan University, and they'd be like, when no matter what would happen, because they're like, you know. I don't know, one-tenth of everybody over there is Irish descent or something. They're all Germans and Irish people. At least half of them went to Franciscan University. And they're like, hey, what do you want to listen to? I've got a fiddle. It's just like, ah, oh, every single night. Oh, my gosh. Folk music is garbage. It is, it is bad music masquerading as traditional. Therefore, we all have to love it. You have to drink. For Irish folk music to be listenable, that's why all the Irish were always drunk. They're like, "Oh no, he's got the, he's got, he's got his fiddle again, past the whiskey." When sacred music has in has a theology to it, see the interesting thing about sacred music is it actually has inherent uh, theology. 
So this is the Orbis Factor. And in theology, whatever note is highest is considered most important and loudest sung. And whatever is most sung is most important. So for this particular um, piece of music, Kyrie isn't important, but eleison is. Christe is more important than Kyrie because there's more notes. Eleison is equally important. Also, the Kyrie is the same height as the eleison. Kyrie. Eleison. I can never remember how many notes are going down, right? The next one, Christe. Going up higher means that's the most important part. So there's an implicit theology in the music. If you just change the words, you mess up the, the entire point of the music. So it's not it's not the same thing. It's not like in jazz. If like, oh, I hit the high note in jazz. You're like, oh my gosh, that's the most important note. There's the, the telos, the end, the point, the whole purpose of driving motion is completely different. So it's not, you can't compare... You can't compare all things like each other as if they were all the same. And also classical music. 90% of all classical music should be tossed out. So like, nah, nah. It's just, that's just like the, these trads. They think so highly. Oh, yes. I listened to Mozart's uh, 70th, 9th symphony, second movement in E flat major. Oh, I'm so cultural. By the way, I think I only wrote 40 symphonies. Uh, classical music, much of it is very orderly. It's written by people who had a lot of order in their souls, a lot of, of rationality and virtue. And they're, they're communicating something of the spirit of that beauty of, of virtue in their music. And it's... Do you, know, do you want to know what the most orderly music in the world is? It's rock and roll. Rock and roll is so meticulously orderly. Bam. More ACDC. ACDC is hyper orderly. So, like, his example just falls apart completely when you actually know music. So, it's like, no, no, no. What he's actually trying to say is that in classical music, they try to make the full sound of the chords and they don't try to excessively layer things. But, like, if you're going to talk about classical music being orderly, and they were, they were, they had this spirit of orderliness in themselves. Beethoven was abusing alcohol. And Mozart wrote music for secret societies. Three of the four seasons of Vivaldi's is complete and total garbage and should be thrown away. Only, like, there's only like two movements that should be I think that's in winter. Anyway, um, every, everyone, pretty much except for Bach, is, is pretty much just toss out. Oh, by the way, Bach isn't perfect either because he copyrighted all of his music. And that made almost all of his music disappear from society until uh, Mendelssohn came by later and, you know, preserved it. So it's like, that's nice to just say, oh, look at this stuff. It's orderly. <laughs> Irish music is orderly too. doesn't make it good. You can't just say, it's got an order to it. <laughs> that's also not even true because a lot of people who play um, classical music don't just do what's on the sheet music. They actually take the sheet music as a suggestion and they'll just add two and three minutes of music in it. You're like, oh my, where, where does this even come from? This is like oversimplification. And that's the problem with this topic altogether, which is why it's so interesting to watch it. If you, I really am convinced about this. If you listen to Vivaldi, Handel, Bach, Corelli, ah. composers like this, especially Baroque composers, and you get used to them, and you begin to enjoy them, which you will by famili familiarity. You yeah, but you'll listen and start to enjoy most everything by familiarity. That, that's irrelevant. Your life will be more orderly. Your spiritual and your psychic life will actually end up being healthier, more balanced, more calm, uh -huh. uh, more self-controlled. All of these okay. sorts of things that we pay lip service to, but maybe we don't really want them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you know, listen to Mozart, become a saint. Everyone who lives, lived during the time of Mozart was a great saint. They weren't just, you know, about to go through an entire enlightenment period and write all sorts of liberal stuff and the ideas of the rights of men coming over the rights of the church. That, that, that had nothing to do with the music. Everyone back then, they were, oh, uh, never mind. Oh, yeah. 
Kant is, is and all the uh, liberal philosophers are going to be doing that time. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. A nice story, bro, but like, can we actually have some truth in the story? Like, just because it works for you doesn't mean it works for everyone. And I, I so disagree with that statement that I wanted to play some Bach. So we're in the um, the Prelude and Fugue in G major. I hope this doesn't get copyright struck. It shouldn't be, because Bach is like. Bye bye, too long for the copyrights. The bass line, bum, 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 bum. the left hand is going, and the right hand is going, bum, 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 bum. completely dancing music. I don't see how you listen to that and you're not overly excited. The bass line Like just the bass line itself is so interesting. Let's listen to that again. I just love this song. It's like my favorite song of all time, by the way. Like, this is supposed to bring order to my soul? This is going to rile me up. I listen to this stuff when I work out. Or I fold laundry over there. This stuff is, like, super exciting. It's like... There's so much going on in this song. Even just looking at the sheet music. Like, it's like watching a circus with elephants and acrobats and a very large lady singing all at the same time. There's probably some trampoline guys going and it's just like, bam! Excuse me, one person on an organ just deciding to make every single person in the church be unable to play because all of a sudden church is done. The only person who's important is the organist. It's like, this is extremely Dionysian music to me. Even though it, it does have a lot of form, it has a lot of well thought out crafted lines it's fantastic but like at the same time it's a it's really like um this is like jazz for its day it's 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 got so much passion in it i don't know what to say i don't listen to this music and go oh yes my mind is completely formed now and and i have all this form and peace and quiet no i listen to bach and i get all excited the the fugue at this bum 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 da 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 it's like that's how you listen to Bach. It's not like oh yes, Bach. I am being enlightened. Oh, is your soul being enlightened? I'm Peter Kwasniewski. That's not how music works. Like, okay, let's look, take a look at another piece of music, right? For the Lord, O oh God, oh, for the Lord God omnipotent. This music is supposed to bring order to your soul. No, this is like throwing pianos off of buildings music. This is like music that gets played like like with something. <laughs> Actually, to my mind, Handel's Hallelujah is completely entirely TikTok music. It's just like randomly there and it doesn't fit the world at all. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. You're like, <laughs> Come on, if you were at church and this was the ending song as the, they were walking out, you would be laughing. The song is like so dramatic, so like malodramatic. This is as bad as anything modern written. And then you're like, oh no, oh man, when I listen to this song, oh, the amount of order in my life. Oh. 
So if you're still watching this episode, it should be very clear that there's hundreds of takes on every single song, every single piece of music, on the passions, on the bass Dionysian response to the music. Maybe you love this, hallelujah, 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 right? And you're just like, oh my gosh, praise the Lord. And you're just like, your emotions have just like bubbled up, bubbled all the way up to your head and are popping out your ears. You are so happy. You can't even hear the form of the music. Why isn't that also um, possible for this type of music? Instead, we are told by the trads, oh, yes. Oh, if you listen to Handel's Messiah, you will become a better person. Will you? Just in case you think that Kennedy Hall really is about the truth and logic of Catholicism, he's not. For him, it's all about a personal experience, just like how he treats Vatican II. And that is the context for this next clip. Ass and all these kinds of things. Um, I, you know, I got into secular music more and more as I grew up and listened to a lot of rap and all sort of stuff. But then when I had a, my major conversion, interior conversion, I was a baptized Catholic, <laughs> but you know, when I sort of took the faith seriously, I went to Guadalupe in Mexico and had a come to Jesus moment and all that. He had a what moment? You know, when I sort of took the faith seriously, I went to Guadalupe in Mexico and had a come to Jesus moment and all that. And I, I was not the type of person who would say things like, I think God just spoke to me. I was like, you know, I'm the furthest thing from sort of a, an emotionalist when it comes to religion. He's the furthest thing from an emotionalist, but, you know, 15 seconds ago, he had us come. I need to make myself again. Come to the Lord. Oh, I went down and saw Lady Guadalupe. <laughs> okay. Okay. Whichever way you want it. Just contradict yourself every 15 minutes. And this is also why he made a 20-minute video complaining that the Sadies were mean to him for not buying his book. He's entirely about logic and reasoning. <laughs> Who am I feeling? Kennedy Hall is about 90% feelings, and the rest of him is beard. So now we're skipping to 16 minutes in, and let's go. It's loud. You could still talk because it <laughs> mm -hmm. wasn't distracting. And that's the big difference yeah. is is if I put on a song that has a syncopated rhythm, I immediately start to feel it in my chest and I can't even concentrate on what I'm, I don't put on the music, but if it's on, I can't even concentrate on what I'm doing. Where if I was around some traditional Celtic music, it could be blaring, it could be so loud, but there's something natural about it where I can literally, if I want, I can tune it out and I can talk. There's a yes. spiritual quality yeah. to the music. Yeah. There's a spiritual quality to the music. You know, when I put on Bach, I, I, it, it's actually very, very consuming of my brain space. That's why I don't always listen to Bach. Oh, wow. There's something to this, but the idea that there's a spiritual quality to music is kind of ridiculous to my mind. If you listen to ministerial type of music, like, um, you know, when they have 10 minute songs, like the, where they sing an entire poem, like this song by um, Laura McKinnett, which I'm not going to play probably because this one's copyrighted, named The Highwayman, which is from a poem by Alfred Noel, uh, Noyes. Noyes? Um, I usually lose interest in that song a few minutes in because brevity is the soul of wit. Not because like there's, oh, there's a spiritual depth to this fantastic 10-minute song by Lorena McKennett. By the way, that's a great song, The Highwayman by Lorena McKennett. Maybe you should listen to it. Maybe you would have a completely different take. Be like, oh my gosh, Sadie Pete, this song has changed my life. Oh. So now for our next clip, the Quan triggers me. What else is new? Yes. I agree with that. And I mean, I would say, and I talk about this too in the book, that amplification is, is really one of the worst things that ever happened to the art of music because when you can project someone's voice or instrument in a gigantic way, in an unnaturally oh, massive way, so that it can reach thousands of people, or for that matter, can just completely submerge a room in noise, right? Um, what you lose is the human quality of the voice, the human quality of instruments, you know, of folk instruments, acoustic instruments, which have a great beauty to them. And they, they when you amplify these things, it's basically like shouting. It's the musical equivalent of shouting all the time. Did you know that um, 
the Kwasniewski is a church musician, and there's this instrument. I don't know if you've ever heard of this instrument before. It's called the organ. It's been around since the time of the Romans. They even had one, I think they had one in the temple in Jerusalem. And what they used to have, the organ, the old purpose of the organ was to hold the note at the bottom. So it was like, the organ was a big hum, and then you could sing above it, right? That was how you found your pitch. At least that's as far as I, I understand. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but um, I think that was what it was supposed to be. Um, so an organ, which is built in a room to have a certain noise, that, that's shouting. Excuse me. What the Quan was trying to say was that when some music gets so loud, it becomes white noise. That is, it actually like is oppressive, and your mind actually stops paying attention, and it starts actually drowning out the music entirely. That's fine. Did you know Alleluia's actually do the same thing? Yes, this is actually a thing, and I'm really confused as to why the Quan doesn't know this because he wants to put this like there's like good music, bad music. Woo! Music is good. Music is bad. If you listen to jazz, you're going to get pregnant. Oh my goodness! Oh, it's not how it works, guys. You saw intentionality still exists. Intentional acts and the passive reception of music, uh, whether it resonates to you and is happy or dissonates with you, and makes you mad. This is all a thing. In fact, within the um, Latin Mass, oftentimes when I've been, which hasn't been for quite a while, yes. But you would be like, oh my gosh, why are we singing this song? I remember at Franciscan, back to Alleluia. Okay, just, just move along. It's kind of boring. And it becomes white noise, an oppressive white noise. Let's listen to this. Alleluia. Oh, we're repeating it already. So one of the purposes of that 40-second Alleluia is to make you lost. It loses its sense of natural rhythm. In the, uh, uh, what is that? That's just empty musical space. And what it does is it starts to bleed out your thoughts. You start to lose yourself in the music. You start to forget. You start to feel empty inside to make you receptive to hear the gospel. Right. There's musical things in this where it's like, yeah, I hear a lot of ah, 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 great, great, fantastic. There's a bunch of ah, 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 ah going on. What am I supposed to get out of this? Well, it's conditioning your response. It's letting you breathe out. It's making empty space, right? It's suppressing mental thought. This is essentially white noise. And then Quan's going, no, it's chant. It's the most beautiful, holy thing of all time. No, no, no. Actually, look at the music. Look at this music. What do you think these notes are? Just because something is sung nice doesn't make it good. The actual notes don't go anywhere. They don't do anything. They're just oscillating between the um the law, the law up to the do, back to the law, to the to the so, to the law, or to the fa. To the fa, to the fa, back to the do, back to the fa, to the t, to the la, to the... And, and it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't even add any words to it. This is a very important thing to do because in, in the Latin Mass itself, one of the things you have is a time to meditate, a time to empty yourself out inside, time to offer up everything, right? So this musically achieves it by pulling away, by removing the person by by removing the normal occasion of rhythmic music and it it completely becomes so boring that you spend your time looking around the church and you're in the church and you're like oh my gosh there's theology here too and then you get the sensation of you're in heaven because everything is just kind of floating and mystical and boring and you're waiting for the altar boy to get one side of the the church to the other side with the book and it's just like yeah 
But the idea that this is some, oh my gosh, the ah, oh, 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 oh my gosh, it's amazing and beautiful and wonderful. Oh my gosh. I, oh, my sins just got forgiven because I got moved in the passions. These people. By the way, that was what actually my uh, master's thesis was on, the concept of musical space. Not really the topic of this video, but I just think it's interesting that there's actually a lot more, um, there's a lot of different takes on what music can be. And if you have this idea of musical space and entering into it and entering into the characteristics, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like a lot of kinds of music because you have to develop the palate for music. Music is really like alcohol. It is. There's like, or it's like drinks, I guess is a better way to put it. There's like fruity tooty drinks, like Handel's Messiah. There's some really good strong German beers like Box Prelude. Then there's some water. It's just water, like Gregorian chant. And sometimes water tastes really good and sometimes it doesn't. And then there's black tea. I don't know what black tea is, but anyway. So uh, let's go a little further on. I just don't get why he's he's harping on amplification. Like you literally sing in a choir to amplify, fill out the sound, fill up the musical hall. It's just like, have you ever seen those big, big, um, I'm looking for a word. Um, I don't know, the big performances. And then they have like a hundred people singing the song and it's like, oh my gosh, they're screaming because it's loud. So for this next clip, the Quan is going to talk, is going to throw pop under the bus. Maybe this is true for some people, but I have no idea what he is talking about. Ratzinger makes this point that it's not surprising that pop music and rock music go together so often with drinking and drugs, mm -hmm. right? Why is that the case? Because when people drink and get drunk, when they take drugs, they're trying, Ratzinger says, they're trying to escape their rationality. They're trying in a, in a misguided way, they're trying to have an experience of transcendence. They wanna get out of themselves. But what they end up doing is they just end up plunging themselves into the lowest and least human part of themselves, right? Um, with all of the bad behavior that goes along with that. What they really need, what they really long for, what they were created for was an experience of divine transcendence, of religious ecstasy, you might say. Um, the kind of thing that is the beatific vision in, in its perfection. Do you know what is the most beatific vision thing of all time? I'll reign forever and ever. <laughs> There's a reason why I present things as are the passions between the Apollonian and Dionysian ax axes in my um my presentation of music. And that's because when you lose the form and embrace the passion of the sounds, it's a kind of transcendence. It actually is. But for Mr. Kwasniewski's opinion, it's a kind of debasement. How dare you lose yourself in the music? You can lose yourself in chants. It's actually true. You can do it. You can listen to this. Hallelujah. You, you can do that. It's possible. You can just like be so in tune with the music and just be like, oh my gosh, this is my praise to God. We did that all the time at Franciscan. Oh my gosh. It's like, it doesn't matter what you're singing, whether it's pop, whether it's praise and worship, whether it's chant, everyone's like, oh my gosh, this music. Um, so see, jazz is very Dionysian. It is. It's like, it's like the Bach. Ja and I find some Baroque, like Bach, and Romantic music to be extremely emotive. They also have a very strong element of form to them. That is, there's a very logical, linear progression and pattern that all the sound takes. And that distracts them a total submersion into the, into the Dionysian. But there's also other music that, um, even though it has a good form, is so re dumb. That I don't know. I, some music I can't even listen to 
Uh, for example, Freebird by uh, Leonard Sk uh, Skynerd, whatever his name is, or some Led Zeppelin songs, they get really boring. I absolutely can't listen to them. I'm like, what am I even doing here? Why is he repeating? It doesn't even sound like music to me. I'm not like I'm just like, oh, I'm fighting. It just is like, it's just boring. It's not resonating me. It's dissonating with me. And it's something I've noticed that if I hear music repeat too much, um, it actually, I start to, I start to hear it repeating. Like if you've had a conversation with someone that you've had like every six months and he says the same exact thing every six months, you're like, I've heard this already. Why is he talking to me? It's like when Free Bird repeats itself, I'm like, okay, we're, we, we just copy pasted the music. Okay, it's awful. So when I write music, I actually listen for that and I actually edit those out. I don't know. It's just something because when you're actually a composer, and the Quaz is a composer, that you get a very different um, relationship with music. And that's what really has to be stressed is music is a relational thing. You grow up with it. You develop a palette. It's, it's literally a palette. And so if you get the wrong stuff, less, just like if, I, if this was suddenly 100% alcohol instead of black tea, I would spit it out. Just like some people can't listen to some types of music. There's a um, a gym I used to go to, a gym down the road, and they'd play some Nicki Minaj. I hate Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj music is the only music I've ever heard that I've always hated, like every single second. I don't even listen to Taylor Swift music. Um, uh, Catholic Family Podcast, both hosts listen to Taylor Swift music. I disavow all Taylor Swift music. And brevity is the soul of wit. 90% of all music needs to be tossed out, including my own. I don't know why I said that, but it was written in the notes. So, you know, just follow whatever the notes do. So anyway, at this point, I'm pretty sure Kennedy Holt believes the Quan is his long lost father. He says, the whole reason I made this whole episode is just for this. It's not just because I like to talk about music. Um, if you wanted more discussion or content on music, I would actually suggest going and watching the Catholic Family Podcast. They did two part episodes. One was a half an hour long. One was an hour and a half long. They were done about a month and a half ago. Very interesting stuff. I don't entirely agree, but who does? For yeah, and for those listening or, or uh, on on Spotify or iTunes or watching this on YouTube, um, one of the big uh, hurdles for people is their workout or running music. So um, I am not a natural born runner. When I'm lean, I tip the scales at 240 pounds. I'm just dumb. I am not a natural born runner. When I'm lean, I tip the scales at 240 pounds. I'm just, um, I am not a natural born runner. When I'm lean, I tip the scales at 240 pounds. I'm just, um, when he's lean, when you can see his six pack, he tips the scale at 240 pounds. So at some point in here, um, they've said, oh no, okay, that's coming up in the next part. By the way, if he's 240 pounds, that probably means he's 50 pounds overweight. Um, please must take care of yourself, Mr. Hall. Like my this whole show is dependent upon you pumping out really bad content. Otherwise, I'd lose the show. I'd have to review Nick more, and I hate Nick. I love Candy Hall. He's funny. He says dumb things like this. Hey, by the way, Mr. Kwasnevsky, my dad, daddy, daddy Quan, daddy Quan. I'm 250 pounds when I'm running. Oh, so when you're not running, you're 260? 250? When your natural body weight's probably closer to 180, 190? By the way, I'm 180 pounds, and I'm a good 10 pounds overweight. It's 250. Maybe you uh, might want to take care of that, Mr. Hall. <laughs> Why would you ever say that on a podcast? I need to listen to that again. I am not a natural born runner. When I'm lean, I tip the scales at 240 pounds. I'm just. <laughs> Sometimes you learn the most delightful things about people. There's there's a ton of Baroque and classical period pieces that are very exciting, very fast paced, very um, driving. You know, if I could put it that way, uh, it, it, there's just yeah. And you see, this is one of these things that's like, Quan, why are you now taking my point? Like. Music's a very dynamic thing. You can listen to Bach and not like it. You can listen to uh, Handel and love it. You can say to Bach, you know, I see what you're doing with this music. You're moving from dominant to secondary dominance to new key to dominance to imitation to a running scale or to descending bass lines. Like it's very, 
a mechanical one. If you really are, um, have a mind to see the form of the music, it's very obvious. But then you can be like, oh my gosh, Handel's Messiah. You see, it, it, you can just do this with anything. This is why people who talk about music and want to be like, oh, this, I don't know, this, this, uh, cure your soul with music thing. It's, to my mind, it's completely bogus. I did a live stream with, um, my brother and David Ross, where we talked about progressive rock and granted it's rock. So it's a particular type of music. It gives you a different effect. It's for a group of people who like that type of music. It's not for everyone. Some of the music I was given to listen to was complete and utter trash. Just throw it away. No one in the world actually will miss this. There's better music everywhere else. And then he was like, oh, I, th I thought it was pretty good. I, I like it. It's a 5 out of 10. I'm like, no, it's a 1 out of 10. It deserves to be thrown away. I think I might have said 2 out of 10 in the actual show. But, like, that's actually a thing. And a lot of people who would talk about music don't realize that, yeah. It's not that hard to tear into any kind of music. So we have what, as I'm going to close this episode pretty soon here, a common trad talking point, and it's pretty dumb. And so the same thing is true about music. I used to challenge my students. I used to say, have a rock-free or a pop-free Lent. So go through your Lent, either do a music fast and listen to nothing. That's very hard for a lot of people, but it's very, it's a very good form of asceticism. Just give up music for Lent and listen to nothing. And then, and then when you're done with Lent, I predict to you that when you put on the stuff you used to listen to, it will bother you. It will be abrasive to you. It will seem, um, it will seem overpowering and kind of rude to you. Like, like it's offensive, right? Uh, You know, my mom has done this for about 30 years now, almost ever since I've known my mom. And it's never worked once. It just literally is fantasy. This is just, so my mom stops listening to jazz every single Lent. And according to Quan, this, this is going to make my mother hate listening to jazz. She's going to be like, oh, why is jazz so horrible? No, because she doesn't get to listen to it. She wants to try to listen to it. And then when she tries to listen to it, she starts to remember why she liked it. And then once she remembers why she liked it, then she just likes to listen to it again. It's like, it, it, this is a literal fantasy. You can have the exact opposite reaction of this. It takes 10 minutes to get back into that song I like and I'm in. Like, oh, whoa. If you can just hold out for 40 days, you'll never, ever listen to Eminem again. Maybe I just won't listen to Eminem again because I just moved on naturally. Maybe there's so much music out there and there's just more stuff to find. It's, not, it, it's just fantasy land that trads have. If, for example, we took the same thing, right? Cake. Most trads don't eat cake during Lent, do they? Oh, but because you fasted from cake for 40 days and snacks between meals or coffee, you never ever return to them. Kennedy Hall is now 50 pounds lighter because... He just stopped eating cake. Where did all the weight go? It just, it just ran away. You know, actually, you could just give up eating for Lent. This is true. And you could just have some of that snake food uh, juice. What do you know with the potassium, sodium chloride? Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. I just cured Kennedy Hall's weight problem. This whole, like, idea that we can just use Lent and just, like, it's a magic cure for everything... If Bishop Sanborn says that, that's okay, because he's a bishop, he has authority. If Layman Joe and Layman Hall want to say this to me, it's kind of laughable, because I've tried this before. It can work, it cannot work. It's, it's just up in the air. And also, um, you can learn to like traditional music. You can learn to like folk music, um, Renaissance polyphony, music of your country, music of chant, music of the Baroque. Music of the English. It's, you can learn to like music without turning off all music. It's not like this horrible thing. Like, and then there's another reason to listen to music. And that's because I want to know what other people in the wor musical world are even doing. Like, people who don't write music don't 
don't have the same relationship with music. We have to have a relationship with music. We have to realize why we're listening to music, what we're listening to music for, what are we looking for in the music. I listen to a lot of Korean and Japanese pop. I do. One reason I do is because I want to hear what contemporary musicians are coming up with. A lot of their stuff is pretty meh. It's bad. So there's a song... Um, just so you don't think I'm just using rhetoric to sound smart. Oh, I'm so difficult. I sound smart. I listen to things. Ooh. Super Shy by New Jeans. It's a, it's a highly rhythmic song, which has a good amount of bass and drums. It's really light in the pads. It's really light in the melodies. It's about two and a half minutes long. It's boring. It's got a very small music idea. It's a super shy, super shy. But wait a minute when I'm making my, making my. That, that's like all it is. Song has hundreds of millions of hits. It's a two out of five at best. It's very boring, uncreative. It plays off of social uh, memes, trash music. It's good for 15 seconds on the uh, TikTok, just like Handel's Messiah. If I wrote it, I would consider it filler music. In fact, I might scrap it as a hook for a larger part of another song. But we all have a different relationship with music. And I was actually going to go to the, through and listen to the rest of this um, episode, but I stopped listening to it here because I actually enjoyed the, the discussion on music and with the recent podcast I've listened to on music, it's actually a very interesting conversation about, about music. I just think that the conversation is very interesting. There's it. I really don't like the idea that we have to be so uh, dramatic and harsh in our ideas of music that you can't listen to rock and roll because there's bad things associated with it because I think that there's a lot of more dynamic things in um older music like with baroque music I mean, baroque music is extremely dynamic romantic music is not as dynamic it's more wishy-washy with emotions and to close off i wanted to look at um a chant because one of the things that chant does is it doesn't have the meter it doesn't have the downbeat and that downbeat creates such an anticipation that also that half of all music pretty much that exists i don't know what i'm saying not even half most music actually just focuses on downbeat. The entirety of Baroque music, by the way, does. There's no downbeat in chant, and it gives it the ethereal, universal sense of music. The rhythm of your heart, the rhythm of nature, all of those are ethereal. There's no downbeats. In ordered, structured form music, for Apollonian music, there is extreme structure with downbeats. There's no downbeat in, in this Kyrie. If you were to sing this in rhythm, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Right? What, what, there's no downbeat. Is it in eight, eight? And then it switches to nine, eight into four, four? Like, that's not music. And so because there's this free flowing thing about um, chant that you can kind of you don't have to get the structure so far down that chant actually becomes very very dionysian but it's not very forceful because it's just the vo voice most of the time that it actually becomes a um a kind of its own genre and because of that i don't think it's it's proper to be like oh this is this is holy music but you have to understand what the chant is trying to do the Kyrie, right? The important points, important notes are the high points, right? The Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. It's a mass dedicated to the Son, the second person, so he's the most important. And everything else is much more subdued. And it really creates a nice affect everything and it's really much more interesting as a musician and as a thinker and a philosopher to have different types of music almost like you have different types of drinks and have a reason and a purpose to drink a reason and a purpose to eat a reason and a purpose to listen to music and that has been not really much of a roast this wasn't really a roast this is just me just having enjoying a Lenten episode more or less yeah this can't definitely isn't an r and r but thank you so much if you got this far. I hope you got something out of this episode. And remember, if you made it all the way in this episode, you are on my prayer list. I pray for all those who watched it the whole way through. <laughs>
God bless you, make keep you. Not leave studio, end recording. <laughs>